Hi there, this is Matt Heffernan. Welcome back to my channel. If you haven't seen the last few videos I've uh, been putting out, they're part of a series of how to do Hello World on uh, different platforms that are based on the 6502 processor. Of course, starting with the Commander X16, then the Atari 2600, and then the Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES. And today we're going to be going one more generation further to the Super Nintendo, the SNES, or Super Famicom, as it was known in Japan. And we're going to see how that sort of compares to the NES, how Nintendo started trying to inch their way into the 16-bit era, uh, while still using something with a, a familiar architecture. And we're going to see that it's really not any easier to do that, even though we're now dealing with a quasi-16-bit system. So first, let's go back again into this history we've been going through of the 6502 processor. So what we're in now is what we've, where we've been basically since the late 80s, which I call the endless autumn of the 6502. So starting with uh, 1985, the same year that the NES came out, Commodore put out the Commodore 128 computer, which was backwards compatible with the Commodore 64, which was the, uh, at the height of its popularity at that point. But the Seed 128 provided a lot of really great features it uh, even had sort of two computers in one. It had a Z80 system within it, so it had full, you know, like CPM com compatibility with uh, like a K-Pro or uh, other uh, type machines uh, from, you know, uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. Now, unfortunately, this being 1985, we are also at the beginning of the, the real IBM PC and PC compatible hegemony in the market and uh, and things were were not going well 8-bit was definitely on its way out in even though it had a lot of really cool features and came out at an extremely affordable price of two hundred ninety nine dollars and ninety five cents of course this was without the floppy disk it was a, a really well-made uh, very capable 8-bit computer but not many people wanted it. If they wanted an 8-bit computer, they wanted the C64, and basically nobody created new software just for the C128. Very few titles came out. So it was, it was not a big success, but for people that liked making their own software for the Commodore 64, the C128 gave a, a lot more options, and uh, there's still a, a pretty, you know, solid fan base for it still, and a demo scene specifically for this machine, which can really do some awesome stuff. But let's moving on now to something also that was kind of successful, and that was it for Apple in 1986, which was the Apple II GS. And that was the uh, last model of Apple II that, uh, that Apple put out. And uh, following the Apple IIe, which was very successful, which was still in the same form factor as the original Apple II, but had a, a lot more extensibility and uh, a lot of really cool capabilities, but uh, it was still an 8-bit machine. So, uh, of course, by 86, this was two years after the Macintosh came out, which was uh, 68,000 based, so a, a hybrid 16-32-bit system. And so instead they created the, the 2GS using the 65816 processor which is a uh, still within the 6502 family, but has a additional 16-bit capabilities. It has a wider address space, and it has a, a lot of 16-bit instructions added to the 6502 instruction set, but it still has uh, 6502 as a complete subset and is fully backwards compatible, and that's what you got with the Apple II GS, was full backwards compatibility to pretty much the whole Apple II software library plus some really great graphics and sound. That's what the GS stood for, graphics and sound capability for the Apple II GS. And, and it sort of gave you, and it even had a, uh, uh, an operating environment very similar to the Mac operating environment. It had the Finder, and, except in 86, Macs were still all black and white, and here was something in full color had really nice capability, and it sold moderately well. Uh, actually, in my high school, we had these. We, uh, we did computer graphics and just general, like, how to use a word processor and uh, spreadsheet-type classes using these computers, and they were really nice to work with. 
And, uh, but it was, you know, on the pricier end, $999 for the, the basic unit. And it was still really good and, you know, somewhat competitive with uh, the IBM compatibles of the day, certainly providing much better uh, graphics and sound capability than even an EGA equipped uh, IBM AT computer would have had at the time. And uh, so, Apple kept it going, and uh, unfortunately, though, it, it didn't really survive uh, that long, and actually the Apple IIe stayed in production even longer. Then the next year, 1987, uh, NEC in Japan put out the PC Engine video game console, a super compact, it, it used uh, memory cards instead of sort of edge connector cartridge ROMs, like uh, the Famicom and the Atari machines all used, and it was extremely popular in Japan. In the U.S., it came out as something called the TurboGrafx-16, but the reality is it still had a 6502, not 65816. It was a 6502 processor repackaged in a new IC put out by Hudson Soft, who actually did all the har hardware for the... Uh, for the PC engine and they were able to uh, have, call it 16-bit by virtue of its graphics capability being 16-bit graphics, a uh, sort of GPU that was kind of 16-bit but really the core CPU was still the big bottleneck of a real 6502 core. And uh, when it came out in the U.S., it was not as successful. It was competing with the NES, and even though it was uh, more capable than the NES in many respects, it was not uh, as huge a leap forward. And then when the Sega Genesis came out with a proper 16-bit processor with the 68000, and uh, really much better capability, better uh, software library, more familiar titles for the uh, North American market. And it, it just never really found a place. But in Japan, it did very well at 24,800 yen uh, in 1987, which in 1987 US dollars would have been about $171, so still a very inexpensive system. And it, 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 it really took off and in fact surpassed the Famicom in popularity for a period. Then in uh, 1990, uh, still in Japan, Nintendo was uh, still experiencing a lot of success, but as you can see, increased competition from NEC with the PC Engine, and so they felt it was their turn to now make that generational leap and do a 16-bit, but initially their goal was to have some backward compatibility with the NES. They wanted to have uh, the ability, kind of like Atari had with the uh, 7800 around this time, that well, we'll just we'll we'll uh, we'll make it so that it's uh, code compatible with the Nintendo. You can stick both ROMs in there, and everything works. Well, they kind of abandoned that after a while, and so you will, as we'll see in this video, some similar concepts are in there to the NES. And it was certainly a guidepost to how they developed the Super Famicom and later the Super NES. And uh, But at any rate, it was still pretty successful in Japan. It came out slightly more expensive uh, than the uh, PC Engine did at, at a, a full 25,000 yen. But, you know, it's it, in reality, see, it's like a 90 cent difference <laughs> when you're going uh, into, uh, into 1990. So inflation wise, it was actually cheaper and oh, it was also very successful and uh, and, and was uh, really a, uh, a solid competitor to the Sega Mega Drive at that point. And of course, the Mega Drive, we know, is the Genesis in uh, North America. And anyway, so the following year, uh, Nintendo sort of uh, made some cosmetic changes to the case, kind of how they did with the original Famicom, and created the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, uh, getting rid of those uh, four primary colors and going with this sort of purple and gray theme, and uh, but still uh, software compatible, and the same controllers, really nice controllers, uh, really you started getting the first controllers that 
started to approach the quality of, of, of console game controllers as we know them today. And it was also very successful in the U.S., but it did have competition from the uh, Sega Genesis. But $199, it was uh, price-wise very competitive and had eventually a very good software library for it and is still very well regarded. And uh, to this day, people are still creating homebrew games for it. And uh, you can even have these little mini Super Nintendos are just as uh, popular as the mini NES uh, <laughs> systems that are out there. And so, but that was it. That was pretty much the end of the line for the 6502, 65816 uh, family of processors. Uh, and what, but what still happened was that the, these processors never went away. You can still buy brand new 6502, or 65 CO2, 65816, all these different processors. They're still used for a lot of embedded applications. They're used for really a, everything but the, an actual new computer, unless it is a little more retro-minded. So it, the future still contains more awesome stuff for the 6502, of in course, including the Commander X16, which uses the 65 CO2. And uh, for a comparison, uh, both the PC Engine and the Super NES both provide a level of capability that is, is very reminiscent uh, when, or rather, <laughs> they are reminisced over when uh, doing development for the Commander X16. A lot of the same concepts are sort of in there, uh, especially with the PC Engine having those 8K memory banks because uh, the Hudson Soft version of the 65 CO2 that surrounds it has built-in memory management for 8K banks and uh, an effective 2 megabyte uh, memory range, which the Commander X16 actually surpasses a little bit, but it's a very similar concept. And uh, but then we'll also see with the graphical capabilities how the Commander X16 starts to approach what the Super Nintendo had. Super Nintendo still, in, in most respects, uh, surpasses it. And so we're going to see now you're playing with superpower. What does the Super Nintendo actually give you? And it's pretty cool. It really, especially once you've been looking at some of these other uh, 6502 based systems. So the actual CPU was a Ryko 5A22, which uh, had within it a 65816 core, and then a bunch of extra features that uh, really made it nice for being part of a video game console. Specifically, it had a DMA direct memory access so that you could easily get between two address buses that it supported, which uh, are, are used for general purpose RAM and video and audio RAM in this particular configuration, and provided the ability to do display interrupts. So you could have line and uh, uh, blank period interrupts, all that stuff that makes uh, the graphics stuff a lot easier to deal with, and parallel uh, I.O. devices like the uh, uh, like the controllers that are, are connected. So there's a, a lot of uh, very good extra features that you get within that die of the Ryko 5A22. And uh, memory-wise, we're <laughs> we're going way beyond what we've seen on uh, these other videos, 120K of main RAM, which was still even in, uh, even though in, by 1991 and 1990, that if you had an IBM PC compatible, you had uh, two, over 256K at, at the very least of RAM. But for a video game console, that was a lot of RAM and you don't really need as much RAM because uh, uh, basically a lot of stuff is running off of these ROM cartridges. And then you had in that other bank with the video and audio 64K of each, which was also just uh, huge. And, and to have that kind of video RAM was also uh, not, not very expected. That's sort of uh, was still a, a newish capability with VGA computers at the time to have 64K of video RAM. And then it supports a, a banked ROM, so you can really populate a lot of ROM banks within these cartridges. And then you can have additional hardware to provide additional RAM memory and even things like the FX2 processor where you had games like Star Fox 
that were actually 3D on this platform. Very, very impressive stuff that could be done. And again, like with the NES, had the openness of the architecture uh, allowing you to be able to really expand upon its base capability. For graphics, we have another chip called the PPU, the Picture Processing Unit. And even though it's the same name as the NES, and it was initially developed with the intention of being backwards compatible, they ended up changing a lot of stuff for it. So it's not fully compatible. There are different chips and uh, really uh, different ways of interacting with them. So for your, your you have uh, background layers and sprite layers. Uh, so each uh, background layer is made up of either 8 by 8 pixel or 16 by 16 pixel characters or, or tiles, however you want to call them. Uh, and generally, they call them characters within the, uh, the programming guides. But of course, that's any sort of background uh, graphics that you see. They're going to be uh, generally tile-based graphics. And then you could have uh, four different background layers. And then on each layer, you would have uh, two priorities so that your, uh, uh, even though it's that one layer, you would have sort of a priority zero and priority one for individual tiles. And then you would have sprites that would be able, based on their priority, may appear in between uh, those two priority uh, tiles within that one layer. So a lot of really good configuration uh, abilities there. There are eight different background graphics modes, and uh, we're going to be dealing with mode zero in, in this uh, demo. But uh, of course, in the very famous mode seven, you had matrix transformation of one big uh, background layer, which was pretty cool. But uh, in all the other um, modes, of, of uh, zero through six, you had independent two-dimensional scrolling of each of those uh, uh, background layers for those different modes. So it, it, lot, it lets you very easily do things like uh, parallax scrolling and just a, a lot of really cool stuff. And then you have the sprites. And you can see here all of the different sizes of sprites that you can have. And basically, you can pick two of these sprite sizes. And those are the kind of the, the format of sprites you're going to have on there. So you can have as little as 8 by 8 or as big as 64 by, six, by 64. And you could just, just pick two. Uh, it's not any two. There's very specific pairs of sizes that you can pick from. And, and then each sprites also have the uh, Z-Depth priority, so it has four different priority levels for sprites. And so that, uh, that priority determines where sprites are going to be rendered in relation to the background layers, <coughs> excuse me, and the uh, uh, priorities of the individual tiles on those background layers. Like I said, the sprites can sort of flit in between those uh, tiles on, this, on the same background layer. And then each sprite can have uh, flipping, uh, just like uh, actually tiles can be flipped also, which is uh, pretty nice. So you, you have a, a lot of flexibility with how graphics look on the system. And for sound, it actually has a dedicated CPU uh, embedded within this chip called the SSMP. And it gave you eight stereo 8-bit sample voices. So you could have uh, eight different uh, PCM samples playing at the same time, each stereo 8-bit. And then uh, on top of that, there was a 16-bit digital signal processor that was able to add effects to each of those voices. So <coughs> very, very uh, great sound capability on there. And with ROM chips becoming cheaper, it became easy to create some really nice sound, incorporating a lot of uh, a, a lot of you know recordings that are digitized on there, and it, it was a very very capable system, especially for the time. So we're going to look now more specifically at Mode Zero, and that's what we're going to be use here. For, mode Zero uh, allows you to have four four color backgrounds. Um, even though we're only going to be populating one of them. So, but it makes it a lot simpler. So it's just four colors for each tile on there. 
<coughs> and so each, uh, each background layer, and since you have four of them, they can each be uh, 32 by 32 up to 64 by 64. And uh, you can really sort of uh, have a lot of leeway in defining those. Basically, you're responsible for fitting everything within that 64K of uh, video RAM. So obviously the sky is not quite the limit, but you, you have a lot of flexibility in being able to prioritize dedicating video RAM to specific backgrounds using as much video RAM as you need for the character data and for the actual maps themselves, so being able to, to figure out what's gonna work best for your game. Now, what's uh, very different, what really breaks the compatibility with the NES is the way those character tiles are generated. As you'll remember before, if you go watch that, the last video, and if you haven't, please do go back, subscribe to my channel, l uh, watch the previous videos, and then come back here and you can see uh, really how different this is. Whereas before you would have uh, eight bytes of a, uh, of a uh, one bit bitmap for each character and then repeat it again for the, uh, the high bit of that character what you have now is you have a uh, line by by line row by row so here we can see the first row here is the the, the top row of the low bit and then the top row of, of the high bit followed by the second row low second row high so that if we have this pattern here for the first two rows these are the actual color index values. You can see I color coded them to make it a little easier to see how they would go in there. So you'd be able to set up your palette to have four colors. You'd be pointing this background at that palette, uh, pointing that, or ra rather pointing that sprite at that palette, and then you're good to go. And then uh, you have effectively really 12 layers with uh, four color backgrounds uh, with in mode zero. So you have uh, eight different background layers. So each background has the two priorities and then there's the four different sprite priorities. So really where any sort of graphical element you put on the system could be in one of those 12 effective layers. So a, you can do a lot of really cool effects that way. And now once in the actual tile map itself, uh, you uh, can do different types of mirroring uh, within there. The simplest being uh, a four-way mirroring, where you're taking that uh, that main map uh, at the at the top of the tile map in memory, those first 400 uh, hex bytes, and just repeating those uh, over and over again. So as you scroll, you're you're just going to see that same 32 by 32 tile map every way you scroll. Um, and then if you do want to see something new, then you have to on the fly add, uh, add in those tiles and modify that map as you're scrolling into it. But then you can also have like horizontal or vertical mirroring where you can have another 32 by 32 map immediately after that first one, at, you know, 400 hex past that starting address. And so those can be un uh, unique on the top. So you're when as you scroll horizontally you're seeing the same uh same stuff uh, or opposite you're doing it vertical so you have uh if you scroll to the right you go to the next map and that but if you scroll down you see the same thing or if you really just want to use up all that vram you can have uh, no mirroring a at all you have uh four different 32 by 32 tiles and of course each one represents one screen so if you have your scroll position at that top corner you only see that first one here this pink one but then you can scroll around and you don't have to uh, modify what's in the map if your entire game level for instance can fit in this 64 by 64 tile uh, area and remember tiles can be 16 by 16 so this is a fairly large area that you have to work in so now let's take a look at what, let's just deal with a, a single uh, one. We'll do Fourier mirroring because we're not going to be scrolling around. We're just going to have a fixed view of one screen. And how do we put text in 
one of these backgrounds. So let's take a look at the code. <coughs> so here is the main uh, assembly language. And again, we're using uh, CA65 to be able to uh, load this stuff. Now, uh, you'll see here that I've uh, included a couple of files. Oh, you know, I forgot to have SNES.ink up there. So first, what I made here is uh, SNES.ink, which is uh, an include file with all of the different addresses for all the registers that you need to interact with. So you can see here we have uh, a lot of this. All this stuff is mostly for graphics, but then we have a few sound things up there. And then, uh, so those are all all your entryway in this 2000 hex area. This is sort of your gateway to the uh, uh, that secondary RAM bus with the video and the audio RAM. And, and then here in the 4000 area, we have these uh, internal CPU registers. And that's how we enable things like the interrupts and, uh, and DMA. <coughs> but then we have special uh, DMA registers uh, elsewhere where we're, we're able to write big banks of data at the same time. But we're not going to actually do DMA here because we're, we're, we're trying to bridge a little more easily from what we did. So then if we, if we look here, I also include caremap.ink. And uh, caremap.ink is, uh, is something you have to do specifically for uh, CA65. Because if you look at my build script, CA65 does not have built-in support for the Super Nintendo. Uh, I, do, I have to provide my own configuration file, which is right here. So this shows the, the memory map of how things are going to be laid out and and then I just I'm going to output this uh, SMC and, and then uh, I'll get the actual hello to ASM and rather than specifying a uh, on the command line I can specify here in the code that I'm using the 816 uh, you could remove this and change your build so that you say dash dash CPU 65816, but you can just do it right here too, and that makes it work just as well. <coughs> Excuse me. And then you can also provide uh, hints to the assembler that you're intending to use uh, X and Y as 16-bit uh, values and the accumulator as an 8-bit register. And that just, uh, again, makes it easier for the compiler to do it. So if, if you were to, to try to build something for a 6502 platform that does not have built-in support for it, like the NES or even the Commander X16, you're going to have to do some of this stuff on your own, too, or find somebody else who did. All right, so now here there's a, a couple of uh, segments that you have to address. Here in the header is uh, just the, the name of the ROM, and so I'm just calling it CA65 example. <laughs> not, too, uh, not too big, but so when you load it up in an emulator, that's what you'll actually see is like that's the name of the game. And then in this uh, ROM info uh, segment, it actually sets up uh, more stuff. And this is, again, more for the uh for the emulators to say all right this is how things are configured because you don't have a, a physical cartridge that has some of these wiring things on there and then here we go into the actual uh, code segment and if you look at the configuration that uh, code segment starts uh here at 8000 hex so below 8000 hex is where we have uh, RAM and uh, register uh, space. But from 8,000 hex on, this is all read-only memory. There's no uh, no writing back into this. And as you also notice here, I don't actually use any RAM because everything's hard-coded in ROM, including my strings right down here. So I use the ASCII Z directive, which gives me, again, a, a, a null terminated string that says, hello world. And by having this char character map included, 
by just basically all the letter characters, their ASCII codes just saying, all right, well, we're just going to keep those the same. And that makes it easy enough so that here uh, it's not going to go and change these because if you don't do that, CA65 is going to assume you're using some weird character set and it's going to mess it all up. So you just sort of have to reinforce the fact that you are doing an ASCII thing. And that's how I've created the character set here. It's the same character set I used in the Hello NES. The character set that comes with CA65 for using with the NES. And I just had to modify that a bit to work for the for the SNES, which I'll, I'll show you later. So uh, the actual code is pretty simple. You have sort of boilerplate stuff that you need to do at the beginning to initialize the uh, Nintendo, get it in a good state. So by uh, uh, clearing the carry bit. Oh, you know what? Let me make sure we are actually in 65.816 assembly so we get the proper, <laughs> proper uh, stuff going here. All right, so now here you'll see these are some new instructions. These are sort of configuring the CPU to, to work in, uh, in this 16-bit mode. We're not doing uh, 6502 compatibility. And then here I am initializing all of those uh, registers that I showed you to zero. And that just makes sure that every, nothing's in a weird state. Everything is in sort of the default state. And then I, I go ahead and start actually writing stuff out to these registers, starting with the palette. And here, like before, I am doing a palette that is uh, sh black and shades of red. And <clears throat> so by just storing zero here, so I am storing zero to CG add. So that's saying that, yep, the uh, I am going to the very top of the palette at color zero, which is the, the background color. And I am then storing zeros twice into this CG data register. So that uh, shows, yes, we are black. And uh, so these, uh, we're dealing with 15-bit color. So, uh, and you're, you're doing the uh, low byte of that first. So those lower eight bits, and then the upper seven bits are in the second right to CG data. So to get dark red, I am doing like a, a half strength uh, uh, red, which would be 10 hex. So those lower five bits, only the most significant bit is, is set. So that gives me sort of a half intensity red and then zero in the upper so that all the uh, blue and uh, green are not getting uh, set to anything. And then neutral right here, I am setting the lower five bits to all high. So this is uh, straight up red and then a lighter red where I again set that one F so that I, I get that uh, full intensity red and then half intensity green and blue by writing a 42 hex to that upper bit. And if you want to look up some more of that, there's a lot of resources out there, but I'm just going to try to get through this. So now to set up the graphics mode, I just uh, reinforce, make sure that I still have a zero there in this background mode register. And that gets us to the default graphics mode, which is graphics mode zero. And it clears the bits that would say we have 16 by 16 tiles. We're just going to still have eight by eight tiles. And then here I've, uh, I've set up a little VRAM memory map up here with uh, these colors. So the actual character set I am putting at the top of VRAM. And then I have uh, starting at 1000 hex, I put in the background. So I, I give myself more space than I need for the character set. So that if you wanted to add more characters, you could within this. But then I'm setting up each background layer to only be uh, 400 hex. So just have 132 by 32. But you can mess around with those two, however you want to do it. And in the end, I, I only really modify background one. So here I say, all right, at like 1000 hex, I am putting background one in there. Uh, and you can see here with, uh, I'm using just the uh, upper 
byte of, uh, of that address because that's all that you can fit in there. And uh, leaving some of the, the lower bits set. Um, and you can look at how that's mapped too, but basically uh, it's, it's the upper six bits of, the, uh, of that 16-bit address. That's what you can put in this register. And then the, the next two bits are, are set up for the mirroring where you can see, as you remember here, the, uh, you, you're, with those bottom two bits, you're selecting what kind of mirroring you have. And I'm keeping it zero, so we're going to have the four-way mirroring, just that 132 by 32 uh, character map. And uh, then here uh, in the, this uh, next register, I am saying I'm th this is how you set what uh, gets used for uh, backgrounds one and two for the top of the character set. So you have the upper four bits and the lower four bits, and those are uh, effectively uh, the uh, uh, thousands uh, place uh, with within uh, RAM. So I at VRAM care set. I am setting that to zero so that both background one and two are going to use this character tile set that's being put at, uh, at memory area zero. And then here I actually go ahead and do that. So first this V main register, I need to give it a stride of one word. So uh, unlike with the NES, you write 16 bits at a time to uh, to this, so uh, it's 16-bit addressing, not 8-bit addressing within video RAM, which can be a little confusing at first, but you kind of have to get used to that. And then I am saying, all right, here I'm loading X with a full 16-bit. This is something that you're not going to see taking an address and just loading it immediately into the X register. You can do that with the 816, so it's pretty nice. And now I'm storing that 16-bit address here in this register uh, with a single load store instead of two pairs. And then I reset my X index to zero so that then I can go through and load up each line of uh, the care set. Now you'll notice way down here at the bottom, I'm including care set.asm so that after this code, right in the, in the middle of the ROM, I'm going to put the character set. And you'll notice it looks very similar to the character set that we had for the Hello NES video, but you'll notice there's no repeating here. So I'm just doing each character once. And you can see here the uh, addresses in VRAM where each of these lines are, are sort of going to be put. Although here I'm doing 8-bit. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Let's go back to the code here. So what I'm doing is loading uh, one row at a time for those characters. But the first time I'm writing, I'm storing uh, zero to the, the low bit. So what I'm doing is fixing that low bit at zero and then taking, and then if whatever bits are set in those rows, putting those in the high bit. So Basically, if we look here, I'm having all zero here, all zero here, and then these may or may not be set so that I'm going to get either zeros or twos in the actual rows. And that will allow us to go with either black or that neutral red, which is remember right here in color two, that was neutral red. So we get that same just basic red color out there. Now you could change this to a, a store accumulator an STA, and then you'll get that light red because then you'll have effectively three for each of those color values. Or you could switch this around and you could get dark red by doing a store uh, A to the, the low byte and then always storing zero to the high byte. And that gives you that color one value. So however you want to do it, you can play around with that as you want. And then I, of course, increment my X counter and then uh, here I can compare that X against a 16-bit value and even do a little math in there. So I know I have 128 characters in my character set and each one takes up eight bytes. So making sure that uh, I just get through 
every single row of every single character and I just keep looping until I get up X up to that value. Then once I do, now I'm ready to finally put that string into that into background one. So uh, I load up with uh, this start TM address. So this is a calculated address that I've created right here by saying, all right, the same as I did before with NES, I'm starting at X of Y of nine and Y of 14, and then calculating that start address by taking the beginning of, uh, of BG1, background one, which is 1000 hex, and then e each row is 32 uh, characters, so I'm doing 32 times start Y plus start X, and I don't, ha and there, even though there's uh, two uh, bytes stored per, uh, per tile uh, entry in the tile map. Again, we're dealing with 16-bit uh, memory, so it, that e since each tile is 16 bits, the math works out perfectly. And then, <clears throat> so I've uh, loaded that up in the X address, storing that in there, and then uh, looping through, you bring X back to zero, and getting one character at a time off hello string, if it's the null character, if it's BQ, then I, I jump down here to enable display. Otherwise, I uh, store that character into the uh, lower eight bits of, uh, of the current word. And then the, I hard code in 20 hex, which gives us the priority of one. So this is at the, uh, at the very front uh, you could just set this to zero, priority zero, since we're not putting anything else in there. You could have a priority zero. And <clears throat> I'm also encoded in here is the uh, zero-based colors, so that, that when we have a zero pixel, it's going to be color zero in our palette. And with the Super Nintendo, we have a 256 color palette, and you can, uh, you can pick out a you have a, a, a three-bit palette uh, selection, so you, you have basically uh, eight different uh, palette locations that you can, you can start with. Um, half as many, of course, as you get for uh, the Commander Act 16, so not quite as, uh, as fun, but you know, you, you're, you're getting there. <laughs> so anyway, um, so we, we, we hard code that configuration byte in there and then we just keep going through putting all the string tiles in there and then finally once we're done we hit that null character and we enable display so we turn on background one uh, so there's this bit here in the tm register that says yep background one's enabled and that you do the same thing for all the different backgrounds and the sprites and then here by setting these bottom four bits that sets the screen brightness in the uh, initialized display register. And then finally, we enable the non-maskable interrupt for the vertical blanks so that we can just, uh, by, by setting this, the most significant bit in this MI, NMI time <coughs> register. And then we're into the game loop. And so now, since we're again, uh, with a uh, 65816 core, we have the wait instruction. And so this wait will actually uh, shut down uh, and save power on the core until we get uh, the next uh, NMI interrupt occurs. And here I'm not doing anything in this NMI interrupt. As you notice down here, kind of how we did with the NES, we have a vectors segment where we have to populate, but we have a, a bunch more vectors that we populate, but still those same three, the NMI, Reset, and IRQ. And you can see here for IRQ and for a bunch of these others, I just point it at uh, an RTI instruction, so they return immediately. <clears throat> but for NMI, it goes through, and just to be nice, I pushed up everything on the stack and then you could do some other stuff, stuff processing you need to do every V blank precisely within that area. And which is generally going to be, you know, maybe making changes to the graphics. <clears throat> generally, that's what you want to do at that point. And then uh, 
by reading this register, the NMI flag register, it actually resets it. So it, it's, uh, it's not writable, it's just sensitive to reads, which is uh, interesting, but that's how it works. And so then uh, each uh, vertical blank, so 30 times uh, a second, we're going to uh, uh, get this interrupt happening. And here, uh, here's where you could do some stuff that is actually happening, uh, processing that you can do uh, while you're waiting for the next uh, V blank to happen. So stuff that's not necessarily gonna affect the current look of the graphics. So you set up uh, whatever you need to, and then you come back around again. But we're not doing anything in either of those cases because we're just keeping that background the same. And that's it, that's, the, that's all the code. Now, yeah, same, about the same level of complexity as you have for an NES. But then here, when I uh, load up SNES9X, now I'm working on Linux here. If you have uh, Windows, and which I have on a VM on my setup, uh, on Windows there is a special build of SNES and 9X that has a nice debugger built into it. So you can actually peek at both the uh, uh, regular RAM space and at the, uh, that, that bus B with the audio and video RAM and see also like current register statuses and it's pretty nice. But right here, I'm gonna open up my Hello SMC, and there it is. It's that same font that we saw before, and basically placed in the same thing, so it looks very similar, but as you can see, it, it took very different code to uh, really make this happen. And so now you can see, within the Super Nintendo, you do not have proper backward compatibility to the NES, but you, you, you can still do a lot of the same things, and now you can see also, how you have the possibility of doing a whole lot more. And uh, that's it. So uh, if you want, go into uh, my GitHub and you can get this repo and use that as the start of your own Super Nintendo homebrew development. And, uh, and then please also go back to my channel, watch my last video on the NES or the rest in this series. And please uh, subscribe to my channel, like this video like my other videos, and of course, if you really wanna get up to date on things, click this bell, get notifications, and you'll know when my next video comes out. And then you can uh, learn more about what I'm doing, some of the games that I'm developing, both uh, on my own and uh, with other folks. Generally, mostly with other folks now, things are kind of uh, uh, getting a little more involved, but I got a lot of projects going on. I hope to have some really cool demos of the work that we're doing coming up soon. So I will uh, hope that you, again, go back, subscribe, watch these videos, watch the series. And now let me know where should I really go from here. Uh, I, I had some good suggestions on the comments of the last video, but please comment on this video. Let me know what you wanna see a Hello World uh, application done on. And don't say a Commodore 64. The, Com the Commander X-16 is exactly the same <laughs> for doing Hello World. We don't need to see that, but maybe something else, something embedded like a video game console is a little more interesting. Uh, so, but, but then uh, what we don't have in this series is really any more interesting 6502 based systems, unless I were to do like a Turbo Graphics 16, but I mean, come on. Let's take a look maybe at something else. So let me know what you wanna see. All right, I uh, thank you and I will see you again very soon.